all do everything we can to avoid our backcountry gear from becoming involved in an avalanche. But in rare instances, it can happen. So we need to be ready. Okay, so we just got the avalanche call out. We got safe. We got a head count. We had three people missing. Okay, we've notified search and rescue. We've decided it's safe to search. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna get everybody lined up across the top of the debris field. We don't have a last seen point. So everybody spread out in kind of even lanes and I'll even you out when you get out there. Today we're gonna to discuss a multiple searcher group search technique known as searching in parallel or lane searching. This technique works for single or multiple victims but is especially efficient for multiple or unknown number of victims. Uh, we found a few techniques, mostly through the research here at TGR and with the cooperation of BCA and some studies we've done. We've made this a very fast and yet consistent technique. This technique is probably best for the avalanche like a, a, a D2, a destructive size 2. The D2 is, is often the common size that skiers will trigger. About, about 50 meters wide and 75, 80 meters long which is pretty good size when you get out there and look at it. Let's go through the steps to organize and execute a successful parallel group search. After the avalanche has stopped, the typical steps are taken, such as assigning a leader, getting a head count, determining the last seen area, and notifying search and rescue, and also ensuring everyone is in search mode. The leader now moves his team to the top of the avalanche debris or the last seen area and begins the search process. Have the team spread out in even lanes at the start of the area to be searched. All right, guys, we got an avalanche call out. There are three victims. I'm gonna take charge on this. What I need everybody to do is spread apart across this slide path, equal distance, and go. The first critical step is for the leader to call out the lane width. It is important as everyone will stay in their lane until they have a reading of the lane width or less before using the directional capabilities of the transceiver. The leader can estimate the spacing by eyeballing or by quickly having a team member pace off the distance between an adjacent team member. Amy, measure it off. Yes. Okay, our lanes are 10 meters apart. So if you have a 50 meter wide search area and five searchers, you would space the team out into 10 meter lanes. The searchers on the ends are five meters from the edge of the debris and everyone else is 10 meters apart. The second critical step is for the leader to establish a call out order the order in which the team will call out their readings. We have five rescuers. One, two, three, four, five. In this method, you only call out your reading at specific points or when you hit the lane width. This order could be left to right, east to west, just be consistent. The leader now has everyone call out their readings in order. If no one has a reading of the lane width or less, the leader then moves down 10 or 15 meters with the group following but not getting ahead of them. The leader will stop and have everyone line up on me. Line up on me! The team will then line up across or perpendicular to the fall line in an even geometric grid, both horizontally and vertically. At each stop, recheck your lane spacing and correct it if need be. Think of this as a large grid surge or digital pro line. Maintaining the geometric integrity of the surge both vertically and horizontally is key. The leader will again have his team call out their readings in order. Lane one. 45. Lane two. No signal. Lane three. No signal. Lane four. No reading. Lane five. No signal. Come to me. This continues until someone gets a reading equal to or less than the lane width. At this point, the searcher calls out the distance and declares going directional. Lane one. I'm at 10 meters, I'm going directional. That searcher will now use the directional capabilities of his transceiver to go to a fine search and eventually a pinpoint. The leader will note that the person has stopped searching in that lane. When the searcher goes directional and finds a low reading on the fine grid search, check and see if there's another signal in close proximity by marking, scrolling, or using big picture mode on their device. If you have another reading close, communicate that to the leader. The leader continues searching the remaining lanes using the same process, moving 10 to 15 meters between readings, calling out in the same order. As other team members get a reading equal to the lane width, they will also go directional to do their fine and pinpoint searches. 
If some lanes never get a reading equal to the lane width, they continue to the end of the path and declare lane clear. The remaining team members who have cleared their lane will be instructed to search up an adjacent lane by the leader. Using this method will ensure the entire area is searched until everyone is located. At any point when the searchers are doing the find search on all the known victims, the leader will reallocate resources to help each search location. That's three beacons located. Lane four, go help lane five. The leader at this point may also assign himself to help one of the searchers extricating the victim. I'll go help lane one. With the systematic and disciplined nature of this technique, it's very easy for the leader to also be one of the searchers. We recommend doing some training just as a leader to build the skill set, but the pace of this technique allows the leader some bandwidth to also be in the search line. The stop-start method sounds slow on paper, but is actually fast in the field. In fact, this technique was the fastest of the methods we tested and resulted in better situational awareness of what was going on. This technique is not for every situation, nor is it meant to replace the proven techniques such as having a single expert searcher out in front with an extraction team behind, as many pro operations employ. Even with the most experienced backcountry travelers, uh, avalanches are always at the forefront. It's an issue for all of us. Your experience doesn't exclude you from that risk. So our mitigation is just be prepared.